Paper stickers to monitor pathogens are more effective than swabs using paper stickers to collect pathogens on surfaces where antisepsis is required, such as in food processing plants, is easier, and less expensive than swabbing, yet similarly sensitive. The research is published in Applied and Environmental Microbiology, a journal of the American Society for Microbiology. The porous structure of paper seems able to collect and accumulate bacterial contamination, said first author Martin Babel, technical assistant, Christian Doppler Laboratory for Monitoring of Microbial Contaminants, Department for Farm Animal and Public Health in Veterinary Medicine, the University of Veterinary Medicine, Vienna, Austria. This requires mechanical contact, for example by hand, or by splashed liquids. In the study, the investigators, who specialize in monitoring cheese production, chose to target the organism Listeria monocytogenes, a pathogen that commonly contaminates raw milk and other raw dairy products, including soft cheeses such as brie, camembert, and feta. They used qPCR, a method of quantifying DNA samples to determine the numbers of these bacteria, as well as of Escherichia coli. Surfaces in food processing plants must be cleaned regularly. Unlike swabs, artificially contaminated stickers provided a record of contamination that took place over at least two weeks, despite washing, flushing with water, or wiping with microzid, an alcohol-based disinfectant, to simulate cleansing practices. Recovery of DNA from the stickers was rather variable, at around 30%, but did not distinctly decrease after 14 days of storage, the report stated. This suggests the possibility of sampling over two weeks as well. In a proof-of-concept experiment, the researchers placed stickers at multiple locations that frequently undergo hand contact, such as on light switches and door handles, for one to seven days. Both bacterial species were detected repeatedly from these stickers. Unlike stickers, swabbing is impractical on complex surfaces, such as door handles, light switches, and other fomites, objects likely to be contaminated with, and spread infectious organisms and does a poor job of taking up bacteria from dry surfaces, according to the report. In the food production facility, conventional swabbing as a standard method can only expose a momentary snapshot, the investigators wrote. For example, it is not possible to reconstruct information about yesterday's status after cleansing has been performed. In addition, when moistened swabs or contact plate sampling methods are used, they bring with them growth medium into a supposedly clean environment, making subsequent disinfection necessary. The investigators showed that plain paper stickers could trap not only bacterial pathogens and related DNA, but dead, and viable but non-culturable pathogens, which also can pose a threat to public health. A major advantage of stickers is in handling, they are easy to distribute and to collect, the authors concluded. We put the stickers directly into the DNA extraction kit's first protocol step. We did not encounter any inhibition or loss of information during DNA extraction, nor during qPCR, said Mr. Babel. Engineered bacteria could be missing link in energy storage One of the big issues with sustainable energy systems is how to store electricity that's generated from wind, solar and waves. At present, no existing technology provides large-scale storage and energy retrieval for sustainable energy at a low financial and environmental cost. Engineered electroactive microbes could be part of the solution, these microbes are capable of borrowing an electron from solar or wind electricity and using the energy to break apart carbon dioxide molecules from the air. The microbes can then take the carbon atoms to make biofuels, such as isobutanol or propanol, that could be burned in a generator or added to gasoline, for example. We think biology plays a significant role in creating a sustainable energy infrastructure, said Buzz Barstow, assistant professor of biological and environmental engineering at Cornell University. Some roles will be supporting roles and some will be major roles, and we're trying to find all of those places where biology can work. Barstow is the senior author of Electrical Energy Storage with Engineered Biological Systems, published in the Journal of Biological Engineering. Adding electrically engineered synthetic or non-biological elements could make this approach even more productive and efficient than microbes alone. At the same time, having many options also creates too many engineering choices. The study supplies information to determine the best design based on needs. 
we are suggesting a new approach where we stitch together biological and non-biological electrochemical engineering to create a new method to store energy, said Farshid Salimijazi, a graduate student in Barstow's lab and the paper's first author. Natural photosynthesis already offers an example for storing solar energy at a huge scale, and turning it into biofuels in a closed carbon loop. It captures about six times as much solar energy in a year as all civilization uses over the same time. But photosynthesis is really inefficient at harvesting sunlight, absorbing less than 1% of the energy that hits photosynthesizing cells. Electroactive microbes let us replace biological light harvesting with photovoltaics. These microbes can absorb electricity into their metabolism and use this energy to convert CO2 to biofuels. The approach shows a lot of promise for making biofuels at higher efficiencies. Electroactive microbes also allow for the use of other types of renewable electricity, not just solar electricity, to power these conversions. Also, some species of engineered microbes may create bioplastics that could be buried, thereby removing carbon dioxide a greenhouse gas, from the air and sequestering it in the ground. Bacteria could be engineered to reverse the process by converting a bioplastic or biofuel back to electricity. These interactions can all occur at room temperature and pressure, which is important for efficiency. The authors point out that non-biological methods for using electricity for carbon fixation, assimilating carbon from CO2 into organic compounds, such as biofuels, are starting to match and even exceed microbes' abilities. However, electrochemical technologies are not good at creating the kinds of complex molecules necessary for biofuels and polymers. Engineered electroactive microbes could be designed to convert these simple molecules into much more complicated ones. Combinations of engineered microbes and electrochemical systems could greatly exceed the efficiency of photosynthesis. For these reasons, a design that marries the two systems offers the most promising solution for energy storage, according to the authors. From the calculations that we have done, we think it's definitely possible, Salimijazi said. The paper includes performance data on biological and electrochemical designs for carbon fixation. The current study is the first time that anybody has gathered in one place all of the data that you need to make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of the efficiency of all these different modes of carbon fixation, Barstow said. In the future, the researchers plan to use the data they have assembled to test out all possible combinations of electrochemical and biological components, and find the best combinations out of so many choices. The study was supported by Cornell and the Burroughs Wellcome Fund. A CRISPR method for gene editing in fungi CRISPR CAS9 is now a household name associated with genetic engineering studies. Through cutting-edge research described in their paper published in Scientific Reports, a team of researchers from Tokyo University of Science, Meiji University, and Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology, led by Dr. Takeyuki Arizo and Professor Shigeru Kawada, has recently established a series of novel strategies to increase the efficiency of targeted gene disruption and new gene introduction using the CRISPR, CAS9 system in the rice blast fungus Pyricularia magnaporth Orizae. These strategies include quicker, single-step gene introduction, use of small homologous sequences, and bypassing of certain prerequisite host DNA patterns and host component modification. The team led by Dr. Arizo and Professor Kawada has devised simple and quick techniques for gene editing, target gene disruption, sequence substitution, and reintroduction of desired genes using CRISPR, CAS9 in the rice blast fungus Pyricularia magnaporth orizae, a type of filamentous fungus. Spurred on by encouraging results, the researchers surmise plants and their pathogens are still co-evolving in nature. Exploiting the mutation mechanisms of model pathogenic fungi as a genome editing technique might lead to the development of further novel techniques in genetic engineering. The working component of the CRISPR, CAS9 system binds to the target gene region DNA, and causes a site-specific double-stranded break DSB, in the DNA. Effective binding of this component requires a certain motif or pattern called the protospacer adjacent motif PAM, which follows downstream of the target gene region. Most genome editing techniques require DSBs induced at the target site, which trigger DNA repair pathways in the host. 
Homologous recombination HR, is a mechanism for repair of DSBs, and it is useful because it adds complementary sequences. However, the underlying methodology is laborious, and its efficiency conventionally depends on external factors such as the host properties as well as PAMs. HR can be divided into two pathways, non-crossover, gene conversion, and crossover type. Crossover type repairs are known to occur in cells that undergo meiosis. However, the understanding of their role in cells that undergo mitosis is limited, and such information on filamentous fungi is virtually unavailable. It is this gap in knowledge that the researchers were looking to address. In their study, the researchers first created a vector gene delivery system based on CRISPR, CAS9 to confirm crossover type HR in the recipient gene region in the rice blast fungus. Then, to check gene targeting or sequence substitution, they created a mutant vector optimized for single crossover type HR for targeted disruption of the host gene that encodes cytolone dehydratase SDH, a protein involved in melanin formation. This vector was introduced into the vector containing the gene for hygromycin B-phosphotransferase HPH, which confers resistance to the antibiotic hygromycin B. The researchers speculated that the single crossover type HR would insert the entire vector along with HPH into the target site. The mutants with disrupted SDH gene would be identified as white colonies owing to loss of melanin on a medium containing hygromycin B. The researchers found that the number of hygromycin B resistant white colonies dramatically increased by using the CRISPR CAS9 vector, which means that the CRISPR CAS9 system is effective in inducing single crossover type hour. The greatest benefit of this technique is that it needs extremely short homologous sequences 100 base pairs, which is really small in molecular biology. The researchers also used a similar strategy to check whether gene introduction or knock-in is possible via single crossover type HR using a CRISPR CAS9 vector. They used the green fluorescent protein GFP gene, which is widely used as a reporter gene to make host cells glow fluorescent green when inserted into their genome. They speculated that single crossover HR would result in introduction of GFP into the recipient sequence. Indeed, they found that use of the CRISPR CAS9 vector gave rise to green fluorescent colonies on hygromycin medium. These findings show that the CRISPR CAS9 system can be used for efficient one-step gene knock-in. This research points towards a surprising fact that perhaps PAMs are not all that necessary for CRISPR CAS9 gene editing in fungi. Hailing the success of the research, the team states, we have found that filamentous fungi have unique genomic characteristics, wherein crossovers are frequently induced, even in somatic cells, by cleaving the target DNA. We used these characteristics to disrupt the target DNA and to introduce reporter genes. We also succeeded in increasing the efficiency and speed of the knock-in using a single-step process. This technology overcomes the restriction posed by PAMs, which is one of the biggest disadvantages of the CRISPR CAS9 system and enables more flexible genome editing, which has been difficult in previous studies on filamentous fungi. Finally, when asked about the broader applications of this research, Dr. Arizo and Professor Kawada eloquently state, rice blast fungus is an important pathogen that causes destructive disease of rice, which is the staple food of the country. The CRISPR CAS9 based genome editing technique developed in our study can speed up molecular biological research on this pathogen, ultimately contributing to stable food supply and plant-based food safety. Also, this technique is applicable to other filamentous fungi widely used in industry, especially in the bioprocessing, food, and fermentation industries. Interactive quantum chemistry in virtual reality scientists from the University of Bristol's Intangible Realities Laboratory IRL, and ETH Zurich have used virtual reality and artificial intelligence algorithms to learn the details of chemical change. In a cover article published today in the Journal of Physical Chemistry, researchers across the University of Bristol and ETH Zurich describe how advanced interaction and visualization frameworks using virtual reality VR, enable humans to train machine learning algorithms and accelerate scientific discovery. The team described their work designing a state-of-the-art open-source VR software framework which can carry out on-the-fly quantum mechanics calculations. 
It allows research scientists to explore sophisticated physics models of complex molecular rearrangements which involve the making and breaking of chemical bonds, the first time that virtual reality has been used to enable such a thing. The team used their interactive VR system to teach quantum chemistry to neural networks. Lead author Sylvia Amabilino, who works between the IRL and Bristol Center for Computational Chemistry, said, generating datasets to teach quantum chemistry to machines is a long-standing challenge. Our results suggest that human intuition, combined with VR, can generate high-quality training data, and thus improve machine learning models. Co-author, Dr. Lars Bratholm, who works between the IRL, the Center for Computational Chemistry, and the School of Mathematics added, for most scientific computational workflows, the bottleneck is processing power. But machine learning has created a scenario where the new bottleneck is the ability to quickly generate high-quality data. Royal Society Research Fellow Dr. David Glowacki, who heads up the IRL across Bristol's Department of Computer Science and School of Chemistry, said, immersive tools like VR provide an efficient means for humans to express high-level scientific and design insight. As far as we know, this work represents the first time that a VR framework has been used to generate data for training a neural network. The rise of machine learning and automation across science and society has led to important questions as to the sort of scientific future we should be consciously working to design over the next few decades. Narratives of our emerging future often cast automation as the ultimate end, and it is sometimes unclear where the human fits in. Professor Marcus Reicher from EVE added, this work shows that advanced visualization and interaction frameworks like VR and R enable humans to complement automated machine learning approaches and accelerate scientific discovery. The paper offers an interesting vision for how science may evolve in the near future, where humans focus their efforts on how to effectively train machines.